In our last session, we, uh, we looked at the First Timothy 3 passage um, and broke down the word episkopos, looked at see how, um, how Paul's writing to Timothy was not only for Timothy, but it was a lesson that he was trying to teach Timothy to then teach the rest of the congregation, the others in the church who were also Christian leaders who were in this young church, building it out, expanding it, going out, um, reaching the cities and the streets, and drawing people um, to Christ. And so, uh, you know, the, the breakdown of the word episkopos, we looked at, you know, how it wasn't just Timothy's job to be a spiritual leader, but it was everybody's job to be a spiritual leader. And so today, <clears throat> in this lesson, we want to look at um, the, different, uh, the different things that Paul breaks down um, to go along with the instructions he gave to Timothy. And the first one um, would be, he, he instructs Timothy to be above reproach. And we hear this a lot. We um, you know, if you've been in ministry or you've been in the church a lot, um, you've heard this this term above reproach. And I think that to a certain degree, it can it can kind of go really extreme one end to the other. Um, usually, we see it on the extreme end of um, you can't do anything wrong, you have to be perfect, you have to um, you know you can't make any mistakes, you can't let anybody see your humanness or um, to see anything break down in you. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's misleading, and I think it's, it's actually improper um, with, with being human. Um, obviously, you know, Scripture tells us that we should strive to be perfect as God is perfect. Um, but at the same time, um, I think that there's also a realistic understanding that we are still human beings, and we still um, are, are, are less than God is. And if God is perfect, then our, we, are, we may strive to be perfect, but we won't be perfect. Um, it, I, to me, it's actually saying um, that you know we should strive um, <clears throat> to keep our integrity intact. We should strive to make sure that we are living according to His Word. Um, not that we don't make mistakes, but that we aren't making unnecessary mistakes. Um, that we're not doing things that um, that would cause question or um, uncertainty about our integrity, about our character, about who we are. Because again, as spiritual leaders. We are held to a higher standard. We are looked at um, uh, to be uh, to be not better than everybody else, but maybe more disciplined or more determined or more faithful um, in our relationship with Christ. And again, this isn't just to the pastor um, of the church. It's to everybody who would consider themselves a Christian or a follower of Christ. Um, we are called to be above approach because if the outside world looks at us and we are doing you know, mundane things that they would consider to be, um, they would consider to be uh, unholy or improper in a religious or um, relationship with Christ context, I think then that weakens our faithfulness, it, or not necessarily our faithfulness, it weakens our witness to those people. Um, and so, you know, we have to strive to be um, above repro reproach. Um, the next one that Paul brings up is husband of one wife. And um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of conversation that could go into this one. Um, I think for, for for the purposes right now, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Husband of one wife, um, we have the divorce, remarriage conversation issue um, of what do we do with that? If if you're if someone commits adultery, if they don't, if you know if somebody is married um, when they're not saved, does that count? And I think that those are those are probably good conversations in certain contexts, um, but I think at the end of the day, um, what we should be doing is to be striving for uh, a proper marriage relationship with one husband, one wife, um, that our lives would reflect reflect the oneness or the unity of the Trinity of our our God, and not this fractured, um, constantly um, fractured relationship history. Um, and, you know, I, I, I understand I come from a divorced home. Um, I understand life happens, situations happen, whatever. But as, as, as followers of Christ, our strive and our heart should always be to, to solely be with that one individual, which puts, you know, a lot more emphasis on how we pick that one individual, who that one person is. Um, are we doing the hard work on the front end, um, making sure that we aren't just going, going willy-nilly uh, on the dating scene, but that we're actually seeking out somebody who we can live um, this life with. 
come alongside and fulfill the calling that God has placed on our lives. Um, so husband of one wife or wife of one husband, um, depending on where you are um, in that. Temperate um, is the next one. Uh, being self-controlled, and we've talked about this in previous lectures, being self-controlled, not to be given over to emotion, not to be um, reactionary all the time, but be temperate, be patient, um, be calm, uh, be collected, be somewhat in self-control, um, not that we are um, just giving ourselves to every whim and every emotion that comes across our way, but that we're more in control of that. And that goes right along with the next one, self-controlled. Um, and there's two sides of that self-control. There's the, you know, um, the self, uh, you know, the self, um, this, the self uh, permission, and um, the self sacrifice. Um, and a lot of times in self-control, we 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 are big on the self permission um, side, but we're not always good on the self sacrifice. We're real good at indulging ourselves, but we're not real good. In, um, in sacrificing or, or depleting ourselves of things. At the same time, you know, even the self-permission comes in enjoying life. Are, are you allowing yourself to enjoy the greater things, the finer things in life, um, the, the smaller things that um, get lost in the busyness? Um, but are you giving yourself, yourself, yourself permission um, to enjoy those things, being self-controlled, being in control of, of who you are, the decisions that you're making, again, not giving yourself um, over to the emotions of the moment or the emotions of the time or the mob mentality. Are you standing on your own um, with what God has told you and where he's guiding you in the direction he's leading you um, because you are an individual and you are in a relationship with God and your relationship with him, and him is directionary, um, not based on what everybody else around you is doing. And so are you in that self-control? Um, again, that self-permission, self-denial, that balance of those two things. Um, the next one, respectable. Um, we, you know, we always talk about being culturally relevant in ministry these days. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, but I think that the, the, the point that we're trying, that, that should be made when we're talking about culturally relevant it's not so much that we're doing things that the culture would consider cool or that are in line with what the culture wants or likes. But to me, that's more, am I, am I mutually respectable inside and outside of the church? The people inside the church, do they respect me? That's obviously important. But maybe even more important, do the people outside the church to respect me? Am I doing the things that, um, that are necessary to demand or command respect from them? Um, and part of that's just creating common ground with them and creating common ground in the world they live in, the world I live in. Um, whether you're a sports buff or not, sports are an easy common ground. Um, you know, current events, easy common ground, easy to start a conversation with somebody <clears throat> and carry that conversation when you're talking about something they know and you know. Um, too often, I think, as Christians, we get caught up in talking about the things that we specifically know in our Christian world, and we lose the common ground with everybody outside of the church. And so are you respectable, creating common ground um, with the people that, um, that you share community with outside of the church. Um, the next one, hospitable. Um, I, I think that as guys, this one can be a little more difficult. I think it can be challenging to, um, to, to understand how to be hospitable all the time. Um, but, but I think that it's important that we understand how to serve others when, when somebody comes into our home or somebody um, is, is in the world, you know, we, we take them to meet our friends or people we know or whatever the case is. Are we hospitable? Are we giving them um, just the time that they need, the attention they need? Are we serving them? Are we making sure they're okay? Are we making sure that they're provided for? Um, obviously, when they come into our churches, are we going out of our comfort zone and out of our way to make them feel comfortable? Um, and that's just all about service. It's all about giving ourselves to someone else um, and giving ourselves over to their needs and their wants and over my needs and my wants. And so are we hospitable? Um, able to teach, I think this is um, paramount for anybody um, going into ministry, <clears throat> anybody who wants to, to live the Christian life and be an effective part um, on this earth. Because if you're not teachable, um, if you're not able to, 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 to be taught and then also able to teach others, 
I think they, then you're going to run into struggles. Um, you know, they say that the more you teach, the more you learn. Um, the teacher is always the best learner because the teacher has to under, not just understand the, the, the static information, but they have to understand the information to a depth where they can then teach it to someone else and field the questions that are necessary. And so if you just take this into a Christian context, do you know the foundations of Scripture? Do you know the salvation message? Do you know Christ's life? Do you know the history of Israel? Do you know the certain things that are important and foundational to who we are as Christians in such a way that you can teach others? Um, and then at the same time, teaching and preaching are two different things. Um, preaching a lot of times is more charismatic, emotional, it's driven, it's motivational. But teaching a lot of times is breaking it down into pieces so that people can understand it. Um, and so I think that, that obviously we want preachers, we want people who can bring the word and who can you know, have emotion and have all those things. But at the same time, it's important that we have people who can sit down and break it down for others and teach effectively. Um, m my theory is that we have a lot of um, incomplete Christians or undiscipled Christians because, because we're losing teachers. We have a lot of preachers but not a lot of teachers who are willing to take the time to break things down. And so uh, Paul is telling Timothy, be able to teach. Um, and then we, 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 we kind of come into this do not uh, section that Paul gives us. Um, do not be given to drunkenness. And um, as some of these other, this is a, a wide open conversation. What does it mean to be drunk? Well, does that mean I can't drink or I shouldn't drink? Or is a, is a social drink okay? And for the... For the purposes of this lesson, I'll say this. Scripture tells us, let each man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, I think that it's important, a lot of times we focus on, let each man work on his own salvation. Um, but I think that the fear and trembling is a vital part of that, of that passage. Because if we forget that we're working out our own salvation in the eyes of God, then I think that we can kind of get off base. I think it's important to remember that, that God gives us grace, He gives us love, and He, he, he walks us through the difficult situations and, and, and decisions we must make. <clears throat> and I think drunkenness is one of those. Um, people will argue that it's cultural, people will argue that, that, um, you know, that some places is okay, other places it's not based on the culture that you're in. Um, again, this conversation has a, a lot of facets to go into it. I think at the end of the day, the bottom line that Paul is saying um, for this specific passage is at the very least, don't become drunk. Do not allow yourself to be a drunkard. Do not allow yourself to drink excessively to the point where you can't function in your own right mind because outside of your right mind is when you make very poor decisions. And as a spiritual leader, as people are watching you um, and as you are trying to be self-controlled, to drink and to lose your, your right mind is to be out of self-control, is to be out of your right mind is to be out of the ability to make the proper, decisive, informative decisions. And I think at the end of the day, in this passage, Paul is saying, do not be given over to drunkenness. Um, and then he also goes on, not violent, but gentle. Um, not be given to violence. <clears throat> Again, um, I think that this is a, a, a lot. There's a lot. Well, what if this? Well, what if this? What if this? What if, you know, somebody attacks my wife, can I not defend her? I think those are... Somewhat valid questions, but I think that common sense would, would rule uh, in, in that world of, of questioning. I think in this one, um, you know, are you, are you a violent individual? Do you, do you push situations to, um, to conflict to where um, it becomes physical confrontation? Um, are, you, are you the type of person that strives on those things? Um, <clears throat> you know, did you, did you burn insects with your magnifying glass when you were a child? That might be an issue. Um, I think... You know, again, Paul is getting to the larger issues. You can't be a violent individual. You have to be gentle. Um, you know, some of the some of the most respectable people for me are men who who I've come across that I know could crush me um, with their hands just by the sheer force of who they are. But they also treat me with the gentleness uh, of a big giant teddy bear. Um, because a lot of times it's the knowing they can crush me that builds the respect in me. Because even though I know that they can. They treat me with a great deal of respect and gentleness and love and compassion. And those are the men who, who draw me near to them. Those are the men who I respect a lot. Um, and so 
not to be violent, but to be gentle? Are you striving to be gentle? Are you striving to make people at peace when they're in your presence? Are you striving to make them feel comfortable when they come around you? Because um, I think that that's, that's really what Paul is getting at. Um, I think that goes right alongside with not quarrelsome. Um, I don't think we, we need to expand on that. Um, not a lover of money. I think that's also self-explanatory. Um, you know, there are two sides, I think, of that. Um, some of us come from very affluent homes, um, didn't have a lot of want growing up, um, didn't have a lot of things that um, we were deprived, and so there's a certain level of um, lifestyle that we are drawn to or driven to, um, and I think we have to be careful that we're not ch chasing a lifestyle um, because of the, the affluency of um, our lifestyle or our jobs or whatever the case is. Um, you know, it's not it's not bad to be um, to be well off. It's not bad to live comfortably. It's, that's not bad at all. But when that's your pursuit, when your heart is after that um, that lifestyle or that money, um, I think that's dangerous. There's also um, those of us who come from um, poorer families or or families who struggled, or or maybe um, your family was on um, on welfare welfare or food stamps or whatever the case may be. And now you have this drive to never be poor. You have this drive to never, um, to never want for your kids that you want to provide for them. So they never, they don't know what that was like for you. They don't experience that. I think that we have to be careful. Even though our, it's noble to want to give something to our children and to provide for our families and 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 be better than what we had when we were growing up, I think it's dangerous because we can then pursue that more than we pursue God. We trust in our ability to make the money more than we trust in God's ability to provide for us. And so, you know, Paul is telling Timothy, don't be a lover of money because money, Scripture tells us, is the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And so um, money is necessary. It's a part of our lives. We have to work within it. But to pursue it as if it's something that is, um, you know, important in our lives and, and losing sight of what God's called us to um, is very dangerous. Um Paul goes on to uh, the two family um, elements of his instruction, manage family well. Um, I think that that's, that's important, especially, again, as ministers. We've had a little conversation about this in, in, in uh, previous uh, lessons, but to, to manage your family well, um, to, to love them, to make them a priority, to not lose sight of them, to not sacrifice them on, on the altar of busyness, all of those things, it's important that we make sure that we're spending time with our families that they know we're loved. Now, does that mean that, you know, your loved, you know, 16-year-old son will not someday just kind of go crazy and, and do his own thing? Probably at some point he will. Um, that doesn't mean you didn't love him, but just make sure you're loving him. Because at the end of the day, you can point and say, well, he did this and he did this. God's going to judge. Did you really manage your family well? Did you really love him? Did you really spend time with them? Um, and again, this is this is a, a sign for others who see us and follow us, whether it be in our churches or in our communities, of can you manage your family? Um, because if you can't manage your family, then you may, it's it's pretty likely that you can't manage the church very well. Um, it's pretty 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 good guess that you can't manage other things well. Your family is the, should be the most important thing. And if it's not the most important thing, and you're managing other things better than your family, then something is out of whack in your priorities. And so I think it's important. Um, it goes on, children obey, um, obey them with uh, proper respect. Um, you know, obviously you want your children to obey you, you want your children to follow you, you want them to love you and do what you say and all those things. Um, I think it's how we speak to them and how we treat them and how do you do you treat your children um, like they're an idiot, like they can't make any decisions on their own? Do you do you give them proper boundaries and proper consequences with those? I, mean, I think that's important. And so I think that, you know, do your children obey you? And, and obviously we all are going to figure that out as time comes. Um, when we have kids, we'll kind of figure out how do we do this dad-mom thing? How do we raise up kids? Um, they don't come with a manual. And so we just got to have to trial and error and figure it out. And I think if our hearts are in tune with God, we listen to Him, we treat them with love, respect, and gentleness, you know, I think that God will, will do his part in, in, in helping us through that process. Um, and then two very practical things. Um, not be a recent convert, obviously. Um, somebody who comes into relationship with Christ 
and is immediately um, put into leadership positions, they haven't had a time to process through what even what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in relationship with Christ, what it means to live a holy life. I think those things are all important um, before you're placed in some sort of leadership position. And so I think that, that we have to keep in mind that we may have a need in our church or we may want to put somebody in position because we have a need. Um, but if they're a recent convert and they're not solid and founded and <clears throat> and they're not stable individuals, I think it's we're doing them a disservice, we're doing a disservice to our churches, and we're creating a lot of strife for us. And so I think that it's important that you know we hold off. Um, no need is more important than a person. Um, we, can, we can deal with a, a, a need longer than we then we can deal with breaking up somebody's um, relationship with Christ or making it too strenuous or, or creating um, pride issues in their lives because we couldn't wait long enough to let them grow up and mature. So, um, you know, Paul says not to be a recent convert. And then the last one, good reputation with outsiders. Um, obviously, um, we don't want to bring, uh, you know, a convict in who's just been released from prison and we don't want to put him as the associate pastor. Um, we probably need to give some time. We need to give him some time to, to, to reestablish himself in the community, reestablish himself in, in life. We need to make sure that we are bringing people um, and putting them in positions of leadership who are respectable inside and outside of the church. Um, not that it's this rigorous litany of, of do's and don'ts to make sure they fall into line, but that it is, um, it is an awareness on our part as the leader to understand that this person has some some mending to do or some growing to do or some relational um, collateral they need to gain. And so um, so Paul does a great job teaching Timothy, who then can teach his congregation who we should learn from and also learn or teach our congregations um, just direction and understanding and wisdom um, in what it means to be a spiritual leader in this world, what it means to be a spiritual leader uh, for um, for Christ and for his kingdom and for what he's called us to. Um, it's not an easy calling. It's not an easy job. Um, you know, obviously it would be easier to be a pagan and do whatever I wanted to and, and live life however I wanted to. But at the end of the day, it's just not reality. It's not, that's not kingdom minded. It's not eternally, um, focused. That's me focused. That's, you know, that's selfish. And so, uh, Paul gives us direction. He says, do these things and not to be not to be, you know, putting a law in place or um, not to create structure for us, but to give us boundaries and direction and wisdom um, to say, if you do these things, if you stay within these bounds, God's going to bless you. God's going to take care, care of you and God's going to lead you. And so um, I think that we shouldn't fight against it, but instead we should come alongside and, and follow it and, and be in line with what um, with what, what Paul is teaching. Um, and so um, so First Timothy 3 a uh, great passage of scripture for us, and I think that, um, you know, a lot for us to learn, not only for us to learn and to put into practice, but for us to learn and to teach our congregation and other Christian um, Christians how to live uh, lives of spiritual leaders.